This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. So we're going to carry on from where we were on Tuesday. So Tuesday I finished by basically working out what the fundamental frequency of a signal was which was already decomposed in terms of sines and cosines. Okay, so we were doing slide number 14 and there are a couple of things perhaps I should have said which I hadn't made clear and that's as follows. There was a typo right at the end. So if you went back to the bottom of your notes, when I wrote out x1 of t, x1 of t is supposed to be uh, 2 plus 7 cos 3 omega naught t. I forgot to put the t in, but there's a t in the expression at the top of the page, so obviously there should have been a t at the bottom. So if you wrote that down and were looking at it as a bit confused, put in the extra t there. And the final thing was, well, a couple of things. Once we worked out what the fundamental frequency was, omega naught, and what harmonics are present, when we wrote down what the Fourier series was, really I was just writing down the Fourier series components, and these are the ones at the bottom. So there were a few questions that were asked. They sort of said, well, how does that relate to a Fourier series? And the whole point was that really what I was doing was comparing this decomposition here directly with the trigonometric form, which was of this form here. So it's the infinite summation of cosines plus sines. And really, you're just comparing coefficient for coefficient. So if you had that as a question, then you literally sort of write out what the trigonometric Fourier series definition is. And just so you don't stress about whether you need to remember that term by term, that will be in a data sheet, which will be provided in the exam. You'll get the data sheet within the next week or so, once it's been finalized. And you're literally just comparing coefficients. So you sort of said A0 divided by 2 is 2. So therefore, A0, well really that's capital A0, is equal to 4. Now. Whilst the fundamental frequency, i.e. at frequency 1 times omega naught, whilst the fundamental frequency is actually, omega naught is a 6 we worked out, the amplitude of a fundamental happens to be 0. And it's quite possible that you can have a periodic waveform where the fundamental has no contribution, and it's only the higher harmonics that have a contribution. So that's why we found that A1, and in fact all the coefficients of the A's are in fact zero apart from the third and the fifth harmonic. So I should really point on here. So that's the third harmonic where the amplitude of the coefficient was seven. So that's why A3 is equal to seven. And the seventh harmonic where we had A7 equal to five, they're the only uh, harmonics for the cos terms that are non-zero. And similarly, the only sinusoidal harmonic which is non-zero is the fourth harmonic so B4 is equal to 3, and Bn is 0 otherwise, and that's what I was comparing with. Now, the question actually said at the top, determine the fundamental period. So I hadn't written that down either, so uh, I did have a couple of questions afterwards. But we had worked out earlier that omega naught was a 6, so the fundamental period, T, is 2 pi divided by omega naught, because omega naught is 2 pi divided by t. So the fundamental period was, in fact, 12 pi. So that, that really was the final answer. I kind of just forgot to mention that on Tuesday. So that's wrapping up that part. Before we move on to Fourier transforms, there are a couple of things on, basically, um, the decomposition of periodic waveforms that I want to look at, because they will become important later on when we deal with the theory of Fourier transforms. So we're going to move on to summary slide number 15, and that's on orth orthogonality. Now, you've actually done orthogonality in the maths course, so I'm not going to spend ages going over this, but I want to give a physical interpretation for what it means. The idea of orthogonality just parallels that for vectors. Basically, if two things are at right angles, they're said to be orthogonal. So. If you imagine if you, had, if you had two vectors, u and v, then they would be orthogonal if they were at right angles. And the question is, how do you measure 
the contribution of a component v in the direction of u. So if you had an angle, so this is just sort of basic sort of uh, vector theory. So you would find the contribution of v in terms of u. You could work out the dot product, couldn't you? So you might, you might find uh, v dot u to find the contribution of v in the direction of u. And you've come up with various, um, various methods of solving that. So it could be a trigonometric form. So I tend to use the alternative representation, which is if these are column vectors, you would also write it as v transpose times u. So if v was a, imagine v is a vector in two-dimensional space, then you could write it as a column vector v1, v2, v3. So that would be in three-dimensional space. And u, you could write as a, a vector u1, u2, u3. Now, I'm going to go with this, and then when, if I keep seeing puzzled faces, I might ditch it, but it depends. Um, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to go with it and then ask you if you've seen this before. But if you wrote that as um, basically as two column vectors, then V transpose it takes a column and makes it into a row, and when you multiply it out, this becomes the sum of the products of the individual elements, VI times UI. And in this case, that will be between I is 1 and 3. Uh, and that's a dot product. So that is a very common form of working out the dot product, so the contribution of one vector in the direction of the other. Now, what happens if they're at right angles? So if theta is at pi over 2, then cos theta is equal to 0. And therefore, that dot product would equal to 0. And if we went by the summation notation, if two vectors are orthogonal, so I'll do this in a different colour pen. If theta is 0, then the dot product, so the sum of ui vi, is equal to 0. So what it's saying is, if I've got a vector in an nth dimensional space, I take the product of the corresponding elements in each dimension, add them all together, and it should equal to 0 if they're orthogonal. Now that's for a line, for a vector in a particular direction. And the question is, is there an equivalent for functional signals. So, one thing I might sort of step back is to, to view different ways of interpreting vectors. So, we can interpret a vector as a point in space. So, if I measure this point here relative to the center of the Earth and rotation, it, you know, it's fixed in space. But I could, if I really wanted to, think of a vector in a different way. What if I plotted the values of that vector uh, against the index of a coordinate. So if I call the x-index you know, direction sort of 1, y2, z3, and I plotted the amplitude of each of the elements of that vector against 1, 2, and 3, what do I get? I could write sort of, if this is 1, 2, and 3, the values of v1, v2, and v3, for example. Now, what, what if you um, went into the ending of interstellar and you end up in four-dimensional space, okay? So I could have another coordinate. And if I went into interstellar part two, then I might as I could go into 12-dimensional space. And string theory is like in 11, 12, 13-dimensional space, right? So I could go into n-dimensional space where n could be arbitrarily large. So a vector or a point in n-dimensional space, I could actually view as being a discrete time sequence, yeah? Because I could just carry on plotting more and more values. So, we'll put, yeah, carry on that diagram, just plot more diagrams, you've got a discrete time signal. If I did that for an infinite number of points, then it doesn't take much imagination to come up with the idea that I'm going to end up with a continuous, or potentially continuous waveform. If I, if I kept it in discrete dimensions, then the definition of orthogonality hasn't changed, that is still true. So, what I'm trying to lead you towards is that the definition of if two, if two waveforms are orthogonal, so if I've got two waveforms F1 and F2, if they're orthogonal to each other, which means that about right angles, which equivalently means that I can't, there's no contribution, say, of F1 in the function F2, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, if they're orthogonal, you can see that that, in the limit, the summation becomes an integral. And if I've got a waveform that is actually periodic, that integral I only need to consider over one period. And that's the definition of whether two signals are orthogonal. Go on.
Thank you very much. Put a nine, nine in front of it. Yeah. So it should be 90 degrees, all pi over 2. So that one I'll declare as an unforced error. <laughs> I'm just, I was just um, not really thinking about everything I've written, but the rest of it's correct from what I can see. Now, what does it mean for two signals to be orthogonal? So in a vector space, um, v, v nu, they're orthogonal at right angles. And it means that the contribution of V in the direction of U is zero. In terms of signals, what it means is, if I try to decompose a signal F2 into simpler building blocks, then those simpler building blocks do not consist of any contribution of the other signal F1. So if I've got a signal and I want to break it down into Lego pieces, then the Lego pieces F1 and F2 will never fit together. I can never make F2 out of a combination of F1 and something else. They are therefore orthogonal. Well, we can analyze the signal, well, we analyze the signal as long as you've got, so using the Lego analogy, as long as I've got uh, enough varieties of different pieces of Lego that when all come together can make an arbitrary signal. But what I'm saying is each individual basic Lego block can't be made out of any of the other basic Lego blocks. So you might want to sort of try and sort of juggle that definition around in your head. I mean, the natural extension for sinusoids and cosinusoids is that you can't represent a one cosinusoid in terms of a linear combination of other sines and cosinusoids. A uh, sinusoid and a cosinusoid are basic fundamental building blocks in terms of signals. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.